Thank you so much for this warm welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here today. I address many conferences, but there are very few with so much positive energy, and I, I really appreciate it. I've been working as Commissioner for Human Rights for a little over four years now, and I've come to the conclusion that the essence of my job uh, lies in several facets of my work. First of all, to give people political and legal ammunition to push for human rights related reforms. Secondly, to remind governments of their human rights obligations and responsibilities, especially towards the most vulnerable. And third, to give targets of human rights violations hope. Not false hope, but a small glimmer of hope. To let them know that they are not alone, they are not forgotten. Trans people need this hope more than anyone. Governments have been far too slow to uphold their responsibility towards trans people. But trans people have the right to live in equality and dignity now, not in some theoretical future. European societies need to recognize the full diversity of gender identities among their members. And trans people have the right to determine and express their individual gender identity and to be fully included in society. Recent years suggest that real progress can be made in fulfilling the human rights of trans people. The European Court of Human Rights was instrumental in establishing the right to legal gender recognition in its landmark judgment in the case of Christine Goodwin against the UK in 2002. Since then, the focus of discussion and reforms has been on the conditions for official recognition of gender identity. <coughs> Abusive conditions of sterilization divorce and the diagnosis of mental disorder have been huge obstacles to realizing the right to self-determination by trans people. In recent years, I've met some of you and I've tried to urge legislative reforms through my country monitoring in places such as Croatia, Finland, Ireland, Poland, San Marino, Serbia, Slovakia, and Ukraine. And I have two, two more years to go in my office, so hopefully I can cover many more countries. simple procedure fully based on self-determination. Uh, in Denmark, Malta, and Ireland, even the condition of medical diagnosis has been abolished. I encourage other member states to follow their example. In its 2015 resolution on discrimination against transgender people, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe welcomed the emergence of the right to gender identity, which gives every individual the right to be treated and identified according to one's gender identity. <clears throat> but along with progress, there are also widening gaps among member states, and some, some member states are lagging far behind. Abusive conditions for legal gender recognition are still a fact of life for trans people in many countries. It's important to clarify current legal standards uh, in this area, and strategic litigation on the condition of sterilization is already taking place in the European Court uh, with three communicated cases from France and last year's judgment in the case of uh, YY against Turkey uh, was a positive step but it didn't resolve the issue completely. Uh, <clears throat> the European Committee for Social Rights and other Council of Europe monitoring bodies are also considering a collective complaint about sterilization in the Czech Republic uh, with reference to the right to, to health. TGEU uh, is one of the parties which brought that case. The extension of the right to marry to same-sex couples has made the, the divorce requirement obsolete in a growing number of countries. In others, the authorities should take measures to respect the will of a couple to continue in an existing marriage after legal gender recognition. The debate about the condition of a medical diagnosis now centered on the process of revising the World Health Organization's international classification, and we need to engage strongly there. <clears throat> While we should celebrate steps forward, we should not forget that discrimination and hate crimes remain a, a grim reality for many trans people in Europe. 
117 killings of trans people in 16 European countries have been documented by Trans Respect Against Transphobia Project <coughs> since that collection began a few years ago. Turkey holds a record, and I was quite surprised to learn that Italy is in second place, so I really salute uh, Bologna's welcoming attitude here. All cases of killings and violence against trans people should be promptly investigated, prosecuted, and sanctioned. And I highlighted the need for this in a statement regarding Turkey last year. The authorities should also send an unequivocal message uh, in condemning such crimes. The 2012 LGBT survey by the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union reported that more than half of all trans respondents felt personally discriminated against or harassed. Over one in three respondents felt discriminated against when looking for a job, and a quarter reported discrimination at work. Almost one third of trans students experienced discrimination in school or universities. That's a lot of pain. Legislative changes are still needed in many countries to protect trans people. Gender identity and expression should be explicitly protected grounds against discrimination in comprehensive equal treatment legislation. Transphobic hatred should be <coughs> included as a possible motive in national hate crime legislation. Hate crimes require a specific response from the authorities, as they have a much greater impact on victims and on society as a whole than crimes without a bias motive. We need to send a very clear message that bias, motivated crime, and discrimination against trans people will not go unpunished. The low level of reporting of hate crimes and discrimination by trans people is another challenge highlighted by the Fundamental Rights Agency's research. This reflects a lack of awareness of remedies and mistrust in law enforcement. It's obvious that police and equality bodies have to be active, they have to be far more active than they are now in facilitating reporting. During my visit to Serbia last year, I learned about a promising practice of regional LGBTI liaison officers among the police with the aim of improving contacts between the community and, to, and the police and to build trust between the police and LGBTI people. Trans people who are victims of transphobic violence also need victim support and police need specific training in this regard. Naturally, we shouldn't forget to address the root causes of intolerance and violence against trans people. If public opinion is hostile to trans people, <coughs> governments have a responsibility to raise awareness of gender diversity and respect for all persons, all persons' gender identity. Education plays a critical role here in changing attitudes, and schools should be a safe environment for all students, regardless of their identity. Confronting intimidation against trans people requires continuous and focused attention from schools and educational authorities. All school children have the right to receive factual information about gender diversity so they can question the stereotypes that are all too common in this area. Trans youth encounter specific obstacles when exercising their right to self-determination. As minors, trans adolescents can find it difficult to access trans-specific health and support services. Legal gender recognition is not usually available to minors. And in this area, we can discern some parallels with intersex children who are often subject to medical treatment without their informed consent to fit into rigid classifications of sex and gender. Current refugee movements in Europe and in the world also involve trans people. Many trans people are on the move Thank you. Fleeing conflicts and persecution on the grounds of their gender identity. It's essential that trans people are recognized as a social group deserving protection under the UN Refugee Convention. European governments should follow UNHCR guidelines in this area in their refugee determination procedures. And the specific needs of trans refugees should also be taken into account in the provision of accommodation to prevent abuse and violence. <coughs> Berlin, the city of Berlin, Germany, has been a pioneer in providing LGBTI-specific refugee shelters. This practice should be replicated in other places. The first European Transgender Council was held in November 2005 in Vienna. And for more than 10 years now, TGU 
has provided leadership and created a truly European trans movement. TGU's current 97 member organizations in 42 countries show the remarkable strength of the European trans movement. TGU has become a force to be reckoned with, uh, and its advocacy work with European and international organizations has been essential for putting the human rights of trans people on the European agenda. It's been a privilege for me and my office to cooperate with TGU over the years in pushing this agenda forward. We have good reasons for celebrating today. We have a lot of work ahead of us. The direction of the movement for trans equality and recognition of gender diversity is quite clear. We already have living examples of our goals in a number of countries. The current challenge is to bridge the widening gaps between different countries in Europe. We can't afford to leave so many trans people behind. We have to fulfill the human rights of all trans people in every country in Europe. I wish you all the best uh, in your deliberations during this conference. And I will remain an ally of the movement for full equality of trans people and will continue to uphold the human rights of trans persons in my work. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for the warm welcome.